Governor Cuomo pushing a plan that would let the state take over management of poorly performing schools in New York City. And guess what? Mayor de Blasio, he's not crazy about the idea. Now, we are talking about, um, obviously, a big issue, guys, as it relates to the city schools. And, Dominic, this is not a new topic. There's been fights for city control for so long. But you got a Democrat mayor who's going against the teachers' unions. He's pushing charter schools. He's trying to take state control of the schools. De Blasio, he's going after them and saying whatever he can. How does this shake out? That's a great question. We really don't know because at the, at the heart of this battle, really, is charter schools. And so no politician will ever concede power, for the most part. That's another battle. But when you look at this, Richard, here's the one thing we know consistently. Kids are being failed year after year after year after year after year. And so you got to do something. So the mayor wants to come along with Comstat that, that Bratton used for crime yep. and apply that to the education classroom. But I, I, I just don't see how that's really going to work. And the governor wants to take a wrecking ball to the system and basically do what amounts to a state takeover. Um, and in my personal opinion, I know we try mm. not to give that sometimes, but I, I'm leaning more towards the governor because something drastic has to happen. Charter it, schools are definitely a part of the a part of this whole routine. I mean, De Blasio has lined up with the teachers union and is opposed to the charter schools. Cuomo has lined up with the hedge fund managers who are backing a lot of the charter schools in New York City. So there's a lot of the divide there. Honestly, I get the feeling that school control might be a little bit of leverage point for other dealings, especially with the assembly, uh, because there's such a New York City delegation in the yep. assembly that will go with de Blasio and will work against the, the mayor. That might be part of the give and take that we're seeing in some of these negotiations. So I don't think the ink is dry on uh, what's going to eventually play it out is for interesting, local control don't you or think mayor the, control. The fight the governor has chosen to fight here. There's a lot of stuff going on, but he has doubled and tripled down, Andrew, whether it's teacher tenure here, whether it's the charter schools, whether it's school control. We talked about the polls last night. The public is more with the teachers on this one than the governor. And, and he's not backing off an iota. In fact, he keeps raising the stakes. When it comes to mayoral control of schools, and it's New York City and other places too, but it's primarily New York City, to me the starkest difference is that he, Cuomo was okay with Bloomberg having mayoral control of the schools and is not okay with de Blasio. I think, he, I think that's pure politics, at least, and Dominic, you know, you, you're a, a political observer on this stuff too, but it's, I don't think he saw Bloomberg as being a potential threat to himself uh, and to being the top Democrat in the state of New York, whereas de Blasio potentially could be a threat. And to me, that's, it's, it has less to do with the issue and more to do with the political pressure. Plus, a, I agree with your assessment, plus a billionaire, a billionaire can fight back a lot more than 100,000 there. <laughs> right, <laughs> than, uh, than de Blasio can. At the, at the heart of this, I don't know how much respect the governor has for the mayor. You know what? I was going to say the same thing. You get the idea that he's outmaneuvering on pre-K, he's outmaneuvering a whole bunch of stuff that he thinks at the end of the day he's got this guy where he wants him um, and he doesn't think he can beat him. Two of them should just go to the track, hang out, have a couple of drinks, work this stuff out. You take this group, I'll take this group, plot out. They would both help each other. They could. Uh, they totally could. That Not doesn't gonna seem happen. to be Andrew's uh, MO. All right, now let's go all the way to Israel where Benjamin Netanyahu's victory it is reverberating big time. Forget about throughout the Mideast, throughout Washington as well. White House they are ticked off that on election day, Netanyahu warned of a left-wing conspiracy to increase Arab turnout, even though there's no evidence that they were busting in uh, Arabs to vote on election day. And before that, the prime minister indicated that there be, would be no Palestinian state here established when it came to his watch. Magically, after the election, he walked back that comment, um, in fact, right on election day. Andrew, I'm sorry, but I know you got to do whatever you got to do to win, right? That's in every, from dog catcher to prime minister, I'm clear. But that's a biggie. To say all of a sudden, no two state, never mind. I mean, come on. It, it's a big deal on a couple of different levels. One is that that is the, the focal point that the rest of the world has rested on for trying to resolve 
the Israel-Palestinian problem. I mean, from the United States standpoint, we're hated by a lot of these extremist groups, by a lot of these terrorist groups, in part because of our support for Israel and Israel's approach to the Palestinians. It's also a problem for Netanyahu and for Israel because at some point they run the risk of turning into an apartheid state. If you go by the sheer numbers in a few years, Israel can be democratic and not Jewish, or it can be Jewish but not democratic, and at some point it's going to be a problem to, to do both at the same time because if it's a pure electoral math, there are going to be more Palestinians, more Arabs in Israel than there are Jews. Otherwise, you have to treat it as not a democracy. Should be a political problem in the United States because they're countering uh, or they're offsetting the, the U.S. position, but it won't be because Israel's such a third rail. Uh, I to hear get into. that, Andrew, that no president's going to. Be, but I don't remember, Dom, a president in recent memory saying that they're going to reconsider the relationship with Israel, which is exactly what the administration is. They've had it. They had it over him uh, addressing the joint session of Congress. They've had it over continual disrespectful uh, taunts they did. They had it over them trying to submarine uh, the negotiations with Iran before they were even finished here uh, to try and kill the deal. Uh, and they've had it now with how he waged that 11th hour campaign in Israel and now all of a sudden flirting with the idea of I am one day for it. I'm a against it the next day, and I'm forward again on when it comes to this two-state policy. I don't think the administration is playing around here. I, this is their last go-around, too. They only got two more years. I, I, don't, I, I think they're, uh, they're not going to bend over backwards for Netanyahu at all. Your list is impressive, and it's factual. The only thing that was left off that list you just cited off, Mitt Romney. That's what, in many circles, let's face it, Mr. Obama and the White House folks, they see Prime Minister Netanyahu as somebody who, who hams it up, at the expense of any type of relationship to benefit him on a political level. And so Mr. Mr. Netanyahu basically wink wink endorses Mitt Romney. So that's bad blood for life between him and the president. But the good thing that we can look in this, Richard, is that this this should not be personality driven. It should be about the the great relationship that the U.S. has with Israel and a relationship that must continue. And you want to you talk politics, imagine Hillary um, and the spot that she's in on this one um, because she she is supporting of the negotiations of the ramp, but on the flip side, um, she knows that this is going to be an important constituency in two years for herself. All right, now, I want to get back to D.C. for a second where the Attorney General nominee, Loretta Lynch, she's still waiting here for a confirmation vote by the full Senate. Nominated more than four months ago, but still she's in limbo. But there were some comments that some people said went too far. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin, he had this to say about the delay from Ms. Lynch. And so Loretta Lynch, the first African-American woman nominated to be attorney general, is asked to sit in the back of the bus when it comes to the Senate calendar. That is unfair. Back of the bus. You got a lot of Republicans demanding an apology from Durbin here. And, you know, they say it went too far. You got Eric Holder as the AG right now, who's an African American. Um, yes, she's a woman, he's a man, but do Republicans have a point, or is Durbin spot on here that part of the reason she's waiting is because of the color of her skin? Well, I, I think what Senator Durbin said was outrageous. I, I, I don't see the comparison to Rosa Parks and Loretta Lynch. I, I mean, I just. I don't see it. She was confirmed uh, for her role as U.S. attorney that she's had uh, for the for the Eastern District. She's had several times. But see, this goes back to my point, and I think you guys disagree with me, that I didn't understand why Mr. Obama, I still don't, I know you point to the merits, went ahead on immigration. When he went ahead on immigration alone, that was the start of a war with this incoming Senate. And so it's not because she's the next Rosa Parks that they're holding this up. They do this to all of his nominees. You know, first of all, I think you're right with the analysis from, from uh, immigration, although I still give the president credit for having done it. I think it needed doing. And it's not like the relationship was so wonderful to begin with. It's not like they were all Amen. singing kumbaya and then <laughs> he did the thing on immigration. Uh, Durbin wasn't doing a comparison to Rosa Parks. He was using the metaphor. It might have been an inarticulate. It, it might have been ridiculous. an inarticulate one, but it also activated a lot of folks out there who are going to be like, "Wait, what?" And all of a sudden, start paying attention to the fact that Loretta Lynch has been waiting longer than any other attorney general nominee, except Ed Meese, who was under indictment at the time, uh, and that it hasn't been done. And it's all just politics 
and and the same gridlock stuff from Republicans that they promised they weren't going to do once they got the majority. So by the way, it's, it's if it's a foul, general, it's a minor kind of one. important to have it, just for whatever it's <laughs> worth. I don't care your politics. All right. We asked a question yesterday to you, um, and it had to do to how to improve voter turnout, which stinks in America. And here are some of the comments that stood out to us. Chanel Rodriguez says that we need online voting. John Lenz chimes in here saying that we should move election day to the first Saturday after tax day and keep the polls open from 6 a.m. to midnight. Not a bad idea. And Austin Pelkey says that we need better civics education, a lot less campaign ads, and marking who is the incumbent on the ballot so it's easier to vote against them. I don't know about that last part here. Um, but at least some ideas, you know? I, I, st I still think that, and I appreciate the ideas that came from the, from the folks on Facebook. I'm not sold on online voting yet. I'll believe in that as soon as you give me your pin number. Yeah, you exactly. know, it's a little right, too yeah. easy to, uh, I still think a national holiday, move it to the weekends, extend early voting everywhere so that people have, if you increase the access to the ballot box, make it easier for people to vote and for people to have their voices heard, I think that helps everybody. You know, I think it's as simple also as everybody gets a mailer saying you're registered show up to this um uh, you know a polling location between what time and what time now you guys are you're much more versus yeah, not you're gonna everybody get gets it right, right? and right. i think people don't know if they're registered or if they are they don't know where they're supposed to go they don't know what they need i think if i mean we get robocalls for everything right give somebody a robocall and just let them know where they're going at what time and like you said move it to the weekend i, I think add, it would make a huge difference i'll add one more make it easier like smooth the process at the polling place i have all the respect in the world for the polling place volunteers they move a little slow and the machinery is a little difficult. I, I didn't have any problem with the old lever system on the ballot box. Whatever happened to that? Oh, hey, don't get them started on the lever system. All I right. like the uh, lever system. When we come back here, a really interesting conversation with a really interesting panel. Pushing New York to stop the state from prosecuting 16 and 17-year-old offenders as adults. We're one of the only places in the country in New York that still does this. we got the folks behind the effort straight ahead.